Hi, I'm Graham Barrett, and it's my pleasure to introduce this panel discussion on understanding consumer purchasing behaviour and building meaningful relationships with customers, brought to you by the customer engagement platform Amasis, an SAP company. According to Amasis's Unpredictions research, almost half of American marketers say that their main priority for 2022 is to invest time in getting to know their customers better. So on today's show, we'll endeavour to do just that by hearing from three US shoppers, Robin, Joya and James, who will give us an insight into their spending habits and tell us what they want and expect from the brands they shop with. We'll also need the brand perspective on the issues raised, so I'm pleased to introduce Greg Brockway, CEO of Cherish, and Vab Dwivedi, VP Digital Products at Satva. And completing the panel is Megan York, Global Head of Product Marketing, Marketing Solutions at Amarsis. Megan, could you start off by telling us a little bit about Amarsis and what marketers should be focusing on in 2022? Sure, happy to be here and thanks so much, Graham and Greg and Vab. Um, So Amarsis is, like you said, the customer engagement platform. And what we really strive to do is empower marketers to reach their customers on every conceivable channel with highly personalized offers and information, um, you know, in order to help marketers meet their, you know, bottom line metrics they have, and also in order for them to, you know, build relationships with those customers that then lead into customer loyalty in the long run. Um, and like you said, Graham, we just released some some research where we talk to lots of our customers and then lots of our customers' customers to kind of find out what we're going to be the priorities or what should be the priorities, you know, going into 2022. And uh, lots of interesting findings. I know that we will dig in uh, today, but some surprising uh, around marketers' uh, role in customer experience and uh, maybe some not so surprising that that email is still a formidable channel. So very excited for the conversation today. Vab, you've spoken this year about the future of customer experience and the importance of investing in digital transformation. I'd be curious to know how you're driving this at Satva. And could you also just give us a brief overview of who Satva are? Yeah, absolutely. So Satva is uh, actually the first uh, direct-to-consumer uh, mattress company uh, established almost 12 years ago. Uh, so sort of innovators in the space of uh, taking a product that you traditionally expect to go into a physical store uh, and find and bring that uh, digitally to our customers. Of course, uh, doing it in that manner provides uh, the company a lot of efficiencies and we hope to be able to pass those along to the customers. So uh, we're uh, excited about uh, continuing on that trend and so a lot of what I spoke about in detail this year as well. How are you driving uh, the customer experience at Satva? Do you want to give us a few more words about that? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, customer experience at Satva uh, for us uh, really is uh, centered as in terms of omnichannel. So in addition to, of course, coming to Satva.com, we have viewing rooms open in multiple locations across the country with more expansion planned there. Of course, you can call in and chat. So multiple touch points that allow us to connect with our customers. And our underlying goal uh, across all those channels is to make it as seamless as possible, regardless of whether it's in person or digitally, we want the customers to have the same level of service and experience uh, across all of those channels. Greg, you have uh, an innovative uh, business model at Cherish of re-commerce. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? And why is there such an appetite for re-commerce at present, do you think? Absolutely. And thank you for the question. Thank you for inviting me here. So Cherish is a leading online emporium where designers and tastemakers shop for exceptional home furnishings, decor, and art. And we're, our business is getting pushed forward by three big macro trends. One of them is just the offline to online e-commerce migration. That's been you know supported and ex- accelerated by the crazy thing the world has been through with the pandemic and supply chain challenges. But underlying all of that is um, sustainability and uh, the growing interest in all things sustainable and sustainability in general. And Cherish plays an important part in supporting re-commerce. 85% of what we do is to help um, home furnishings and online goods find new homes and second lives. So we're, a, we're an important part of re-commerce uh, and sustainability for home furnishings. And the growing interest in sustainability is really driven by much of what the world's been going through. It's more active with, it's more important to, to younger shoppers, but it's increasingly important to everybody. And we're proud that that's uh, part of part of the Cherish mission, an important part of the Cherish mission. 
Great. So we've heard now from our panel. It's time to hear firsthand from consumers about what they want and expect from brands in 2022. Hi, my name is Robin Curian. I'm 40 years old. I'm originally from Massachusetts. I am single and I have no kids. When I'm purchasing things, I'm still very old school where I love going into, I love walking into a store, going into the fitting room, trying on clothes, feeling the, the actual fabric. I do love the in-store, but I also realize I don't have a lot of time always. So yeah, I do, I do both. I'm Joya D. Bradley. I'm an artist living in New York, uh, 51 years old. I have one child. She's nine going on 18, it's great. I'm married uh, happily, that's good. Now everybody's getting back to this new normal that we've got going on. I'm seeing that uh, I've leveled off on purchases a bit, but I'm also more mindful and planning what I exactly need. And so now I'm all about getting rid of stuff and only using what I need and only buying brands or purchases that I know I can get through. So it's changing, but I still find myself buying more online than I do actually going out and doing things. And so for me, it's brought my love of delivery <laughs> to a high expectation and excitement. So there you go. <laughs> I'm James. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, but I have lived in Brooklyn Heights for the last 30 years where my wife and I raised our boys. They're both now grown. My oldest son has uh, lived in his own place for about four years now. My youngest son is just coming home from college, so he'll be staying with us for the foreseeable future, hopefully not too long. When it comes to purchasing, those things that I'm very familiar with, that I already know what it is, it has a model number, a part number, I'm really happy to buy online, but the things that I'm going to wear, the things that are more personal, or I really need to see it, hold it, put it on, feel it, see the construction, the color, the fit, all of that, and understand it. I, I'm always struck by the trend toward online shopping because I, I, don't, I don't have much luck with online shopping. A couple of key exceptions to that would be the in-app purchases, like somehow Instagram really has my number. The stuff that, that it shows me is just beautiful. Now, I'm sure it's not beautiful to everyone, but it's beautiful to me. So I've discovered a couple new brands that way. Anytime I'm buying something, the things that are important are color, materiality, the feel of it, quality. If it's a garment, how it fits. If it's furniture, how it sits. You know, it's, I think there's a lot of tangible elements that may be subtle, but you want to review with the object in front of you or with the garment on you to know how it's going to fit or feel. And then there's the intangible side too. I mean, I think with a retail experience, you get the opinion of other people, a shop clerk helping you. They introduce you to things about it that you may not have seen, aspects of it, colors, features that it has that might be more appealing. You know, I never mind being sold something that I want anyway. So those are our shoppers. Lots of interesting things said there. And I guess the one key takeaway is that they all have different ways of wanting to shop. So getting to know your customer is absolutely crucial. Greg, um, at Sharish, everything on your site has been screened by your curators, which I guess automatically gives you a, you know, a great and a strong connection to your customers. What else do you do to, to build a meaningful relationship with, with them? So we're a, we're a marketplace. We're a curated marketplace. So we start by taking things that we think are going to be important, relevant, and interesting for our community. So that's kind of the foundation. And then we do as much as we can to make it even more engaging. Trust and engagement, what marketplaces are, are built around. And the way we advance is we start with a, a interesting, relevant product and then we merchandise it into collections. We promote it through our blog. We have a, an award-winning podcast. We bring in tastemakers to curate and, and celebrate and explore what's interesting for them. And then we push it out through email and increasingly by trying to personalize the shopping experience to make it as relevant as possible for the people who come to us um, based on what we can intuit that they like and interesting and relevant. So it's all about taking um, a broad 
assortment of product and helping people as quickly as possible find the things that are most relevant for the design challenge that they're trying to solve. So it's, it's not a one, there's no silver bullet. It's a lot of little things that hopefully add up to an engaging experience. And it's part, and it's all supported by also, um, you know, world-class um, customer support. We pay close attention to what we're doing that customers like, and we try and address the things that are making people unhappy. And we're, we're proud that we are earning consistently world-class net promoter scores from our, from our audience. And we, we monitor that very closely. Yeah, sure. And you tell me, but I guess there must be a really great sense of community amongst your customers as well. Would that be fair to say? We, we think about our business as, as a community. Yes, we're, we're, we're a community of buyers and sellers and helping them explore um, the, you know, exceptional home, home furnishing products. So these are people who value design, uh, who, who either are collectors or who are people who, who are trying to solve and create comfortable, engaging, engaging, chic and unique living spaces. And so that's a, that is a, a broad, interesting a community of creative types who love design. Definitely. Yeah, thanks for that, Greg. Fab, if I could just come to you uh, just on this subject of customer engagement, how, how do you do that at Satva? Yeah, I would, I would echo everything that Greg just said from an online perspective. Uh, for our business, we also have uh, you know, the opportunity to touch our customers uh, off the website as well. So whether they come into one of our physical viewing rooms, whether that be in Manhattan or Los Angeles or any of the other locations that we have, or if they pick up the phone and call or, or decide to chat, you know, one of our uh, underlying goals is to make sure that our customers have a seamless experience and it feels the same no matter what channel that they're coming to us uh, through. Uh, we take a lot of pride in ensuring that uh, whatever our primary brand value propositions are, uh, they're coming through to the customers. Uh, you know, white glove service is a big part of our uh, value prop for customers. Um, you know, we don't uh, sell bed in a box. We're not just going to leave a king size mattress on your front door and, and wish you the best of luck. Um, so we are uh, we're really focused on making sure that that uh, comes through very clearly to our customers that uh, above above all else uh, the customer service aspect is what we really want to make sure uh, that we project throughout all of our channels sure megan uh greg touched upon it earlier he was talking about the importance of email in their marketing and that's still really crucial for for brands today isn't it so, you know think other things may have overtaken it but why is email such an important tool for marketers? Well, you know, it's listening to Greg and Vab talk. They talked about trust and engagement and loyalty and, and this, um, you know, re-importance of first-party data. And that email address is really the key to unlocking all that first-party data, right? So, I mean, that's how we, at the very, very rudimentary level, that's how we know who a customer is, you know, who they are and allows us to understand their shopping behaviors and their browsing pay behaviors and what they put in their cart and, and what they eventually buy. And, and all of that helps to understand our customer and their preferences a little bit better um, to create, you know, wonderful online and offline experiences. But, but email is still such an important part of activating that first party data. You know, customers still say that email is their preferable um, you know, method of, of interacting with a customer. And people know when they go when they go in and they check their email, um, you know, there's a lot of buying intent there, right? So, you know, we may not be checking those promotional emails all the time every day, but once we go into a store, we think, I wonder what that store has been talking, or, or onto a website, you know, I wonder what they've been talking to me about for the last week or so. Can I use any offers? Do they have anything interesting for me? And so I think, you know, understand, you know, being putting in innovative ways to, to grab that email address, to continue learning about that customer, and then activating those really personalized offers or information in the email channel. You know, we always say what's old is new again. Um, but really, you know, all of the changes and consent and privacy and all that has sort of bubbled email back up to this really, really um, important channel that we're thinking about how do we do, you know, some big innovation there when a channel that's been around for a really long time absolutely we know that email is still huge because we spoke to some of the shoppers directly amasis asked 2000 american shoppers about their spending habits in 2022 and found that one in 10 which is very surprising want personalized products that are bespoke to them almost half of consumers say email is their preferred contact method by retailers here's what one of our consumer panel said about brands contacting them uh, my favorite brands communicate with me 
all the time, every single way that they can. Text, email, just popping open social media, they'll come up. And the latest one that I found that they're doing is, if I'm watching TV, for example, um, you'll have a source of three ads that come up and they're like, go ahead and pick one. And whatever you pick, they start to tailor the ads that are going to come to you to try and market to you. I think it's kind of brilliant because at least you're not inundated with stuff you have no clue and don't want to watch. So the messages are personalized and I absolutely expect them to be because if they're not, that's when I get really ticked off. I'm like, how did you wind up in my email and what are you doing here? It usually turns me off to a brand that comes through that I have no clue how they got there or what they want. So if they, if it is personalized or it's something along the lines that it aligns with my spirit, then I'm more likely to pay attention to that particular brand. The brands that I have shopped for online do send me emails that are customized to me. They send me things that are similar to things I've bought before so that uh, the implication is, well, if you liked this shirt, you might like this jacket in the same color or, or this kind of thing. And I think it's somewhat successful. I mean, I always have need of something. And if, if it tumbles into my inbox from a brand that I know, I'm more likely to just push play and, and let that arrive than to, to you know, put in the effort to go out and find something new. When these brands that I purchase from do send me emails, they often are, hey, James, you know, you like this. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and I think that's okay. I, I, I enjoy that, actually. And, and I realize it's a computer of some kind. It's an algorithm, but that's okay. It's, it's a brand that's interacting with, with a human being. And so I do like it when it's personalized in that way. You know, I've also ordered things for my wife online, which means that sometimes I get with some frequency, I get emails with skirts, dresses, handbags. That's, that's when it's a little funny. It's a little strange. But shoppers say it's not just the way brands communicate with us. It's also about their ethos. Here's what our panel said about what brands can do to get their loyalty. I think it's really important to make sure that your brands are like socially and environmentally like knowledgeable. I, I think it would be kind of sad if you're a fan of a brand and they don't even acknowledge like what's happening in our in our world. It's important, I think. Yeah, especially like the times that we're living. I think you do have to be conscious of stuff like that. The brands themselves, yes, I do want them environmentally conscious, right? Sometimes that does not align with my pocketbook. You know, you might be a little low on funds and it's $15 as opposed to, hey, that really nice that, you know, they're giving back to the community, but it's 35 and you need it tomorrow. What are you gonna do? Um, we try. As a consumer, it is up to you to do the research. What people put out in their marketing can be true. Sometimes it also can be a great spin job, as we say. You mentioned it earlier, Greg, the circular economy and sustainability are, you know, the very ethos of Cherish, aren't they really? Why is that resonating more and more with customers? So uh, we're really uh, great. What started for us as a passion around um, innovative design and unique one-of-a-kind product has touched so many people for, for different reasons. One of the most one of the most powerful current reasons is because it is supporting the growing interest in all things sustainable. The world's been through some really challenging times, and there's a growing appreciation that sustainability and being kinder to the earth is an, is an important value. And so what we've been trying to help people do is to accomplish their design goals and create you know, interesting living spaces, but do it in a way that is kinder to, to the earth. So what, what has attracted people to Cherish is because we're in an interesting place to find surprising and delightful things. And what keeps them coming back is because when they buy things from us, they are they can feel like they're supporting. Um, it, it's a smarter, stylish, uh, friendlier to the earth way of uh, of buying and and furnishing their home. Um, the circular economy is a is a buzzword, um, but what it really means is helping um, items that can find to find second and third lives. It's shocking and horrifying that almost 12 million tons of home furnishings winds up in a landfill every year. And much of that could, could be repurposed, reused, and, and inspire, inspire others. So there's, 
you know, what we try and do is first help them recognize that buying vintage and antique is, is, a, is kinder and gentler to the earth. And if they can't do that, buy something that's high quality and can be enduring that they can pass on to others. There's a negative cycle of fast furniture where you buy something cheap, you use it for a year or two and you throw it away. And we think there's a better way of furnishing your home that's more supportive of, of that's growing interest in all things sustainable. Yeah. And when you talk about sustainable, obviously, we think about the things you've just spoken about, the environment and, and reusing and objects and uh, furniture. But it's also about sustaining business, isn't it? Because you deal with a lot of small businesses. So you're really aiding and would it be fair to say saving them in certain instances, you know, certainly during recent times? During recent times, there have been some very dark days. If you're much of the home furnishings industry is made up of small businesses, whether it's stores or and during the dark days when things had shut down, we were grateful that we were one of the few ways they were continuing to put food on the table. So for us, this has all been a very difficult time, but it was a, a bit of a silver lining for us to know that we were by, by powering through these difficult times, we were actually helping others um, in, in this broader design, design, many reasons to feel good about what we do. We we try and encourage shopping locally. Um, we try and uh, encourage uh, and help uh, businesses manage through this transition from a purely offline world to a omni-channel online and offline uh, world, which is the future of all things, all all types of commerce. And and we think it's a, there's a positive path through that for everyone. Yeah, and I think that might resonate with you as well, Fab, because. Uh... You know, would you like to tell us a little bit about how you're utilizing technology to help your customers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think uh, Megan touched on uh, email a little bit, and uh, obviously the uh, the efficiency of email from a branding perspective is very important. Uh, in our business, the uh, life cycle uh, and the customer journey is actually quite long. Uh, the research process is uh, is pretty long, especially since we're selling a product that traditionally folks would go physically into a store, they want to touch and feel. Uh, and so from a technology perspective, what we're trying to do is better understand customers' intent uh, and what their questions are, and then digitally uh, try to replicate uh, that experience of going into a store as much as possible. Um, and so, you know, the, uh, the different views that we can show on products, the ability to engage uh, using augmented reality, seeing product in your space, understanding how it's going to fit uh, the aesthetic. It's not just a mattress that you might be buying from us. It could be, uh, you know, an upholstered bed frame, uh, additional items that uh, complete the look uh, of the space that you're outfitting. And, uh, and technology plays a very important part in uh, bringing that to life, uh, letting customers feel like uh, they understand exactly what it's going to look like and feel like once they uh, get it set up into their home. And so that is something that we're definitely investing a lot of money in uh, and feel like it's something that can really help to differentiate us uh, in the marketplace and, uh, and make customers feel even more comfortable when they make this purchase. Uh, we try to give them as much comfort and possible with our post-purchase support, whether that be around our returns and exchanges. But um, you know, the, the best return is one that you can prevent because you've got a has happy customer from the beginning. So uh, that's really where the focus is and, and technology plays a big part in that. Yeah, sure. What about you, Greg? I mean, um, does any of that resonate with you in terms of the technology that you're utilizing at Cherish? Obviously, we're talking about vintage items that are being resold, but in terms of the platform, I guess technology is key, right? We're trying to use technology to make it easier for people to feel confident that they're making the right purchase. And that is, you know, for, in home furnishings, uh, augmented reality has been very powerful. Being able to see what something's going to look like in your own is a great way of helping get confident that this is the right purchase for you. Uh, having accurate, extensive descriptions of the object is helpful. Helping people identify more things like this, which is sort of part, you know, going down the path of personalizing the shopping experience is also technology driven um, and an important part of creating a more engaging, trustworthy, easy to use shopping experience. And then, you know, we're entirely focused on the home furnishings market because there's still so many unsolved problems when you're talking about a digital shopping experience. And we think uh, the tools that Vab is talking about and, and Megan's talking about too of, of uh, you know, newer tools like augmented reality, virtual reality, and then older st standby tools like email are all powerful ways to 
increasingly engage, bring people back, show them things that are going to make them happy um, with their purchases going forward. And if you make someone happy, uh, you're right. They don't want to return their item and they'll hopefully come back, back to you in the future again for more. Megan, it'd be great to understand what are the benefits that AI can bring to the marketer? Yeah, you know, so when we first introduced AI, the whole conversation was, are, are the machines going to take over our jobs as marketers? And there was a lot of trepidation there. But actually, we know that marketing teams are so resource constrained um, that really what we're seeing is that marketers are starting to embrace AI as really just an extension of their team. So, you know, Greg and Bab have great um, use cases here, right? They both have businesses where having that one-to-one -one human interaction, whether it's helping somebody, you know, define the right style and piece of furniture for their home or the right mattress, those are all kind of, you know, white glove, as Vab said, type of businesses that are sometimes have been hard to translate those, that kind of experience over to the digital world. And AI can help do that, right? We can start kind of digitally asking, uh, uh, you know, consumers, what are you interested in? Um, what's your decorating style like? How many hours of sleep do you get? Those types of things. And learning about the things they're interested in and being able to recommend those project products online or in an app or an email, uh, digitally kind of creating that consultative experience that I know is really important um, for both of your businesses. Um, so that's kind of the customer experience, you know, aspect of AI, but there's also really the inner workings of our marketing departments that are influenced by AI as well. You know, with every click on a website, a customer is creating a piece of data about themselves that we can learn from. And it's just nearly impossible, impossible really, for a human to go in and digest all of that data and then get insights from it um, and, and understand what we can learn from it or what we should do with it. And so what we're seeing is that, you know, businesses are using AI to understand what customer should they be speaking to next? Who is likely to make a purchase? Who is likely to unsubscribe or churn um, as a customer? And using those insights to get really, you know, a lot smarter about their marketing. So AI impacts, you know, the customer experience, but also how we operate more effectively and efficiently as marketing teams as well. Fab, what I'd be really curious to know from a brand perspective, from a Satva perspective is, is AI something you speak about on a daily basis in team meetings and the like? Well, I think we're past the point of, of necessarily speaking about the technology because we're actively leveraging it. I think uh, one of the most important places is uh, in our data. So like most companies, we have more data than we know what to do with. Uh, we have an abundance of data and our goal is to turn that into an abundance of insights. And one of the ways that we do that uh, is by leveraging the power of machine learning to better distill all of that data across the different points of the customer journey. We have a very long uh, life cycle. Uh, of research, consideration, purchase, and, and post-purchase support, uh, and tons of first-party data that we need to really uh, aggregate and uh, better understand what customer intent is. And so uh, machine learning and AI play uh, a pretty critical part, not just in understanding the customer, but of course serving up uh, more relevant digital experiences as well. I think the promise of AI is, is to help uh, the people who need answers get them faster and more easily. So data is becoming increasingly overwhelming and the machine getting smarter at helping us figure out how to get our important questions answered. So we don't talk about AI or machine learning specifically at our meetings or our staff meetings, but under the covers as, as we are working to process that ever more quickly, uh, it's becoming increasingly relevant to how we job. At the end of the day, we're trying to answer uh, important problem questions for our customers, and the faster we can help our team um, get to those, get the strategies for how to do that, the better off the whole the whole business will be. Yeah, Megan, I'll come to you about how we can harness this data. But Vab, what are your thoughts? Because obviously, Satva was one of the very first direct to consumer brands, so I'm guessing that gave you a lot of first party data from the get go. Um, how are you leveraging that data and what are the plans moving forward? Yeah, so as I mentioned previously, you know, the, the customer journey, essentially the life cycle is quite long uh, when you talk about a mattress purchase. Uh, and surprisingly, the vast majority of it is in research and consideration, uh, really in, in high level research. And so our ability to start 
uh, engaging with customers happens very early on. Um, and the first party data really helps us understand intent at every step of the way. Uh, what we're able to do is uh, build connections with customers, not just by uh, positioning products or services, uh, by also just talking to them generally about sleep, health, and wellness. We have uh, an extensive library of content uh, that we uh, share with our customers about you know better sleep and uh, things that may be impacting uh, their day to day if they're not uh, getting the right type of rest. Uh, and at every step of the customer journey, our intent is to be as relevant as possible. So the first party data rel really helps us pin down uh, where is this customer right now in that journey and what's the most important thing that we can show to them. Uh, and you know going back to tie it together with AI or machine learning, we're able to leverage that technology to go from uh, targeting customers based on wisdom of the crowd and getting closer to that one-to-one -one personalized experience uh, that really highlights the relevancy for them. Megan, would you like to come in there? Because I think that that probably echoes a lot of the thoughts that you have about harnessing all this data. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as we talk about um, consumer expectations, consumers are expecting a value exchange now with our brands. So consumers have said for a very long time that they were happy to give up their you know, information if it meant that they were going to get something back that was valuable to them, whether that was a, uh, you know, an article recommendation or a personalized product recommendation or an offer. Uh, but I think you know, as a marketing space, we, we may have pushed the limits a little bit far you know, with some of the tactics that we were employing. And, and so then that's when a lot of the you know, privacy and consent and regulation conversations started happening. But I truly believe believe um, that if customers are experiencing that value exchange, as Vab was talking about, this is a significant purchase. If, if they're able to say, you know what, every time I go onto the website, I'm learning something valuable that's making it clearer and clearer for me that this is a really good purchase for me to make. So that, you know, that's building trust, um, that customer feels like they're getting their needs met, um, and all of those things go to building loyalty. So, you know, all of these, you know, the customer doesn't care what's going on in the back end for us to be learning all of these things about their intention or what they're interested in. All they see is that experience that they have and, and if they're getting value from it, um, you know, then, then we've done our jobs and, you know, then and leverage AI in the right way to be able to, to offer that to the customer. Yeah. And what, what do we all think about, you know, what the future holds for, for the customer? Because I guess, you know, that's why all these things are in play. As Megan says, this is what all this technology leads to, isn't it? It's presenting something to sell to those consumers. Uh, Greg and Fab, I mean, you're both pivotal kind of figures in, in the home sector, where do you see the future for your businesses and the home sector in general? Greg, maybe I'll come to you first. What does the future hold for Cherish? Well, I, I think consumer expectations are just going up. And it's absolutely right that to be a delightful brand, you have to give people, you have to make people feel like they're getting more than they're putting into the, to the effort of using you as a shopping destination. And technology plays an important role on that. It's helping to improve and make it easier to find what they're looking for. It's how we uh, try to make it easier to support people getting what they're, uh, what they're purchased faster than, than the competition. And when problems do arise, it, it helps us to address them more quickly with either the most relevant information or the, the, right, the right process. So I think the future is bright in the sense of, you know, technology is helping you know, brands that are adopting it to deliver more value in experience. Um, but it's, it's also challenging because that means that we all have to be investing in, in always trying to push ourselves to make, to make what we, to do what we do even better. And that's, that's hard. And I guess from your point of view, Greg, the, the, the appetite for re-commerce is, ju is just going to continue. I guess uh, that's what you hope for, but that's probably what you expect as well, is it, with the way the world is going? I think um, the home in general is more to people of the future than it, than it did in the past. It's no longer just the place to eat and sleep. It has to do all sorts of other things. So, um, and, and in addition to that, I think how people furnish their homes is increasingly important, as, as it is with how they dress and how they, how they act and where they buy from. And so I think sustainability is one of the underlying tailwinds that's supporting us as a business and will help another tailwind that will hopefully help move the world in a positive direction. 
Yeah, brilliant. And Vab, what about from Sapper's point of view? You've been a an innovative brand from from the start, haven't you? What, what how do you see the future panning out? Yeah, I think uh, for us, it's important that we stay on that track of innovation. Uh, we really have set uh, the North Star as being a focus on customers. And we've talked a lot about relevancy uh, for them today. You know, I think the way that I would summarize it is, um, you know, sort of the, the motto that we think about internally uh, is really not to just focus on top line uh, business goals, but we are focused on solving customer problems. And if you solve your customers problems, they will solve your business problems. Uh, they are they are intricately uh, connected. So, uh, you know, that's that's our focus going forward. Uh, we continue to look at new ways that we can leverage technology uh, to still bring our products to life uh, and, and make it feel like you can really get a sense of what's going to be delivered to you uh, and how well it's going to benefit you uh, in the long term. Um, you know, we're selling a product that uh, customers will spend upwards of a third of their life on for as long as they have it. And so there's a there's a very deep uh, connection, uh, literally, with the product that the customers share. Uh, and our, our mandate is to make that as relevant and enjoyable for them as possible. And uh, that, that remains our North Star. Excellent stuff. That's a superb way to end. So thanks to our panel for their wisdom today. Thanks to our shoppers for sharing their shopping habits. And thank you to you for watching. If you want to download the uh, Imarsis report that we spoke about and predictions, you can do so at imarsis.com. Thank you.